Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to our quarterly global investment strategy presentation. Um, there's still a few people joining, but I think we can kick off. My name is Pierre de Klerk. I'm the Managing Director of Boutique Investment Partners. If there's anyone um, on the line that have not met me before, um, usually the English version of this presentation is presented by our Chief Investment Officer, Tavonga Shavise. Uh, but unfortunately, he is undergoing uh, eye surgery this week, so I'm standing in for him. But uh, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for joining us. Um, and as I always say, we do this presentation at the start of our uh, quarterly meeting around with our clients uh, in order to give you um, some time to digest the material before we see, your, see you for your meetings. So I hope it's... Um, it's helpful. It takes, uh, it's it's the culmination of about two weeks of internal investment committee meetings. So it's quite difficult to distill the content into something relatively short, um, but it takes about an hour. I, I hope to not be busy much longer than an hour. So let's um, get right into it. And the, um, the theme that we picked for this quarter's presentation, given um, the way the market's been going and what's happening from a macroeconomic point of view, is a theme of, of patience to say that in our assessment, there are still certain uh, risks that prevail, especially from a macro point of view and a monetary policy point of view and an inflation point of view. Um, and for that reason, we think we will have to be patient in our positioning um, to ensure that our portfolios are correctly positioned um, for the next 12 to 18 months for the opportunities that might arise, but also for the risks um, that might prevail. So if we immediately move on, um, I, the first few slides is just the introduction as usual. And I want to make the point that our approach is very much one of collaboration with our clients. So we're trying to strike a, a optimal balance between um, the objectives of your investors and of your uh, financial planning practice, and also the investment objectives of the portfolios. And we apply the house view that we uh, research and generate across a number of mandates and different clients of ours follow different approaches. Some invest in multi-asset loss funds or balance funds. Some invest in specialist building block funds where uh, each asset class is separately populated and represented by a manager. Um, and then there are portfolios that are effectively blends of those two approaches. Uh, but whatever our house view dictates, uh, we try and translate sensibly into these different approaches that we discuss with you uh, at your meeting, depending on how your portfolios are structured. As multi-managers, we also believe that there are multiple angles to the investment process that need to be considered. Um, it is not only about valuations of asset classes. For example, if, uh, if one only focus on bottom-up valuations to the exclusion of anything else, then I suppose you're a, a, a value manager um, and that comes with, with a certain uh, return profile. Um, but as multi-managers, we believe to build robust and very stable portfolios, uh, we need to consider a, a number of different aspects uh, that feed into the investment process. And that's summed up uh, in this picture and We've covered it in the past with you, but I'll just quickly mention, we start with macroeconomics. So what is going on in the world from economic point of view and everything that feeds into that. Um, ultimately, it's about identifying what regime we are in from a market and a macro point of view, where we are in the business cycle, where we are in the investment cycle. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about that. And then we consider all the sub elements. So we look at the valuation of currencies. We look at the valuation of the asset classes themselves. We look at the valuation of styles. Um, we look at the regional allocation, and then we bring it all together uh, in a coherent fashion in, in portfolios to say, well, you know, how do we bring all these things uh, sensibly into the portfolio? Uh, for example, there might be good valuations, but if the currency risk is against you, uh, in, in particular geographies, then you need to take that into account as a compensating factor. So just a, a very brief summary of, of why we look at all the angles and how we approach it. We standardize all our signals. So we measure 
economic signals, valuation signals, um, all sorts of things, but we standardized it onto a score uh, kind of range of minus three to three. Um, and that basically means when something gets a three score, uh, it's it's good news. You know, it's it's a stimulated economic environment or it's a cheap asset class, whatever positive news uh, defines for the metric that we're looking at. And then similarly, if it's minus three, then it means very negative. Uh, and typically that means we underweight because of a, a certain uh, measurement or, or reason. So that's just how we standardize all the calls so that, um, you know, the research is not kind of all over the show. And we also translate that to the way we look at currency risk, depending on how far the RAND, for example, are from uh, fair value, looking at purchase power parity as a long-term measure and also short-term measures. Um, we, we assign a score to that in terms of how careful we need to be um, with overseas investments, as an example. So that's the, the currency loss uh, example. So moving, moving right on to the... The, the topics at hand and leading into the main part of the presentation. Um, what is important is a, a, a regime framework or to know where we are in the business cycle, because again, as an example, it might well be that particular asset classes or geographies uh, show good value from a fundamental valuation point of view, but the cycle might be completely against them, meaning the economic cycle. And then you need to take that into account uh, and um, and compensate for it. So where we currently, just to give some color to it, is that um, we do believe the US is late in the cycle. Their economy is starting to cool down. In fact, the Fed is trying to cool down the economy to control inflation. Um, but interesting enough, they've had a, a strong market, which is typical of a late stage of the cycle. And I'll talk a bit more about that in the presentation. But the US is definitely towards the kind of the end of a cycle and there is uh, recession risks that prevail. China, for example, is in a very different spot in the cycle. They, um, they've they had a very low growth, uh, slow last two or three years, two years since COVID, because they had a very long and uh, disruptive COVID lockdown. And only from the start or from the start of this year or the end of last year, have they started to reopen their economy uh, so they are now on an expansionary footing in terms of where their economic growth is going to, um, and they're really going to be in that first part um, of the cycle. So we we look at the different geographies in the world also against the backdrop of where they are in the economic cycle, but these things will also take um, time. It will take patience um, for all of this to, to play out, and we do uh, acknowledge that as well. If we just do a recap of what happened in the, the, the year so far, in the first quarter of the year, um, equity markets were generally strong, um, and much of the positions that we hold in our house view also performed strongly. So gold and gold miners did well, uh, equities X, the US did well, US equities did well, Chinese equities um, and EM equities did reasonably well, which uh, is a is a position in our house view. Um, SA property right at the top didn't do that well, but all the other asset classes, as you can see, gave you um, quite good positive returns. Um, but one must acknowledge that in the DM space and the US space, there is also the largest uh, downside risk because of the valuations. Uh, of those markets, and I'll talk a bit more later when we when we reflect on the valuations um, around that. So we we do think there might be kind of a, a change of a regime um, and a rotation, but it might take time. And to that point, the second quarter was quite different from the first quarter. So in the second quarter, what we found was that it was very much um, all the way the U.S. Um, and they pulled other develop markets with them, but it was a very uh, narrowly driven equity market dominated by the U.S. and effectively driven by uh, a few shares, so what they call the, the Magnificent Seven, um, that are tech shares that are related to the artificial intelligence theme. Um, 
uh, and, and they really drove much of the market, which I'll illustrate a bit later, almost to the exclusion of 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 all the other shares in the S&P 500, um, but they did they did drive the market and it influenced the the global equity markets. Unfortunately, it was a quarter in which much of our house view positioning uh, that is a bit more defensive because we acknowledge the the risk that prevail, recession risk, monetary policy risk. Much of those positions were not rewarded in the second quarter, which was this kind of strong tech driven. Uh, momentum are in the quarter. So things that didn't work was China. There was uh, especially the China uh, A shares, the, uh, the onshore shares in China. After the original optimism about the reopening of China at the start of the year, there was a bit of air coming out of it and a bit of disappointment about uh, the speed with which they stimulate their economy. And that put pressure on the Chinese equity shares. So Chinese equity shares didn't do that well. Uh, SA bonds, for a number of reasons, didn't do that well. And that's the, the, the prime defensive asset class in which we are um, positioned to trim risk. And that didn't work well in the second quarter. Um, as you can see, global gold also lagged, but SA equity was about flat. Um, so it, it was a very different quarter from the, from the first quarter of the year, uh, dominated by momentum, dominated by the U.S. equity market, and specifically the the AI-related tech shares um, and the more defensive uh, areas, asset classes, and the more um, early-stage markets like China uh, not coming through. So a, a bit of a, a quarter of aberration. And, um, you know, within a downtrending market, um, typically you get these rel relief rallies. And, and this quarter was was one of the quarters that kind of um, had the the signs of that, or, or carried the kind of the, the elements, the elements of that. The graph on the right hand side uh, shows the the performance of the Magnificent Seven that I mentioned, and it just shows, you know, year to date what have been driving the S and P market, for example. And you can see it's literally seven shares that gave most of the. The returns of the S and P 500, and the remaining the remaining 493 shares uh, were really fairly um, anemic. So quite a narrow market, which made it difficult for uh, active managers by and large, except if you were a uh, 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 a momentum manager. If you were a momentum manager, then you know they cottoned onto that trend, or a growth manager, maybe a quality manager, but a, a general stock picking manager uh, at maybe a tougher time. Uh, the quantitative products, uh, the smart factor products, because they are more diversified across factors, also uh, struggled on a year-to-date basis. And we have observed that um, in the returns of, of some of them, like the Satrix multi-factor products um, and even our own and so forth. Um, if you look at the graph on the left-hand side, um, it shows very interestingly, again, a picture of the uh, the market cycle and it's broken up in deciles. Um, so what they show is in history, looking at the the S P five hundred, if as you move through the business cycle and the investment cycle, in which decile, in which ten percent period of time, do you get which returns? When do you get the strong returns, um, and when do you get the the weaker returns? And very interestingly, the first decile in the market cycle. So post the recession, when the market is down and out and now starts recovering, um, the first decile is a very strong performing decile. And that's quite intuitive because you, because you, you post recession, um, there's interest rate cuts um, that, that, that comes out that's gonna stimulate and the market look forward and discount that. Um, and also your valuations are low. But then thereafter, through the remainder of the cycle, you get positive returns, but but much more muted returns. And then very interestingly, the last decile um, of the market cycle before the next recession is, is a strong one. And that's um, anecdotally referred to as the, uh, the euphoric, the euphoric part of the market or stage in the market. Um, and I think there's a number of reasons why it's, it's maybe less intuitive than the first decile. 
but I think there are reasons that one can think of and point out why late in the cycle, uh, right towards the end, you can get these very strong returns. And, and it relates, for example, to reasons like the fact that monetary policy works with a lag. So, you know, you get to the end of the cycle, then you've had the full experience of lower interest rates or interest rates that, that were cut to stimulate the economy and the market post the previous recession. And then you get to kind of the, the peak effect of, of accommodating monetary policy. So that what might be one reason. Um, another reason might simply be uh, sentiment and momentum that, that many people kind of see the returns in the buildup of the last number of uh, deciles of the cycle. And then they kind of get pulled in at the, at the peak of the cycle or at the top of the cycle. Um, we also know there's a there's an element of that, um, but the last decile is although it gives you strong returns by historic analysis, it's quite a from a risk point of view a, a dangerous part of the cycle in which to look for returns. You know, to chase returns in the last decile um, is 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 risky because after that typically comes the rollover and the recession, which more often than not comes with a bear market or weaker markets. So one needs to think very carefully about chasing returns in the last decile. But unfortunately, it gets more complicated than that in a sense that it can go on for longer than what you might expect. You know, there's no um, palliation is a poor timing tool. So there's no uh, definitive you know, indication as to how long this end of cycle might take. Um, and turning to the AI phenomenon, if a bubble is going to develop in US tech and uh, an AI driven bubble, then I'll show it a bit later compared to the previous NASDAQ bubble, but it might be that this goes on uh, for longer than one expect. So we also think about that and say to ourselves, well, that means you can't completely be out of the US, even if the US is kind of leading the cycle and is late cycle and is the most expensive market, there might be uh, these, these other fundamentals that is in favor of that market and you must be careful to be completely out of it. So at the end of the presentation, I'll cover how we deal with it, but we, we deal with it by making sure that we have enough exposure to growth managers and quality managers that typically will uh, access this kind of uh, opportunity uh, related to the, to the tech shares or the growth shares the long duration shares. Um, and that's that's one way of um, of making sure that one has some exposure to that, even, you, even though you know it's it's a bit late in the cycle. But I think the 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 general point that we want to make, as the heading of the slide says, is that regime changes as you move through the through the economic and the business cycle, uh, it does take time. There's leads and lags. Policy works with the lag typically, um, and that means it it can be painful, and and patience can be or is usually necessary. Um, you're never going to perfectly time it. You can't time the market in and out so so exactly. Um, we prefer to focus on the fundamentals of which valuations is part, but also the the macro and the regime story, um, and then you you need to apply patience because these things do take time. Um, to 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 play out, if I put it that way. So it it is so, and worth pointing out that the strong U.S. market performance that we've had um, over the last number of years, but certainly also now uh, this year to date, has again increased the valuations of U.S. equities. So they have become more expensive, and one way of looking at it is at the equity risk premium. So the the, it's a comparison of the, the earnings yield of, of equity versus bonds. And if that uh, line is at a high level, then it means there's a large equity risk premium and you are being rewarded for having that equity exposure. But if the line is low as it is now, it tells you that things have become very expensive and there's very little compensation, uh, if any, uh, of, of being in equities compared to bonds. Or the flip side of it is bonds are giving you a much better return 
um, than what they previously have. And as we know, the uh, the bond yields globally have risen, um, and you are you are getting a four percent return. For example, on a U.S. ten-year bond now, where three years ago you got fifty basis points, so um, the the risk adjusted certainly um, reward profile of bonds have improved materially, and vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the uh, the opposite is that um, the uh, reward that you stand to get from equity has diminished as equities became more expensive. And this is what the picture looks like for the U.S., as I mentioned, and because the U.S. also dominates uh, the developed world, the picture for developed world equities does not look very, very different. It looks a bit better. So Europe and Japan um, are certainly better valued um, and have a, a better valuation prognosis compared to the U.S., um, but as a, as a group, the developed markets are... Um, are, are, are relatively pricey and um, as they move up further if they do move up further it is it is more um, again multiple cons uh, expansion and and momentum that drives the market as opposed to the market moving from from a cheap level to a to a fair level or a more expensive level there is um if we just zoom out again and talk a bit about the, the macroeconomics and the regime a bit more. <clears throat> there is, uh, we think, enough kind of historic evidence that that still point to being cautious if you think about recession risk. And um, one very obvious such metric to, to point out is the uh, inverted yield curve. So these graphs show the U.S. 10-year and two-year uh, yields deducted from each other, and also on the right-hand side, the, the U.S. 10-year and three months. Um, but across the board, even if you look at the 30-year versus the short end, um, you see this inverted yield curve, meaning the short end is higher than the long end. And whenever this yield curve inverts, it historically have been a very good indication of uh, recession risk. And we can see it on the next uh, slide, which is just a, a graph over a longer period of time compared to the previous one. So this goes back to the 60s, and it shows the, the same two lines or the same two yield curves, 10 by 2 and the 10 by 3 months. Um, and as you can observe, there's probably been 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, uh, or 8 um, official recession periods. And before each of those recessions, you you had this inversion of the yield curve. There was in one instance in the in the late sixties where it briefly inverted, and they did not experience a recession. But every other time, when the yield curve inverted, um, it it did foreshadow a coming recession. So I think this is a there's there's obviously a, a lot of kind of theory and and explanation behind this. So. You know, we don't say you must just kind of bluntly take it at face value, but but even so, you know, even at face value, if one consider the 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 number of instances in the past, then it just tells you as long as this is, is inverted, uh, as it is currently quite deeply inverted, we need to be um, a bit more careful because it, you know it certainly points to elevated um, recession risk. There are, are other metrics that, that point in the similar direction, showing that you kind of late in cycle for the U.S. or kind of in this euphoric part of the cycle. Um, one more of those is the, the slope of the Fed curve on the left-hand side. And all that that does is it, it looks at the forward expectation for, for the rates. Um, so it looks 18 months ahead at the futures, what they think the, the U.S., Federal Reserve interest rates going to be, uh, and again deducted from the current rate. Um, and as you can see, before recession, you get this phenomenon where the forward-looking futures are predicting that the rates will have to be lower because the Fed will have to cut rates uh, because of the recession to start stimulating the economy. So when the line line falls, it says that easier monetary policy will be necessary in the future. 
And when the line starts rising, then it means um, tighter policy will be necessary. Now, it's interesting that this line, although it's deeply negative, have started to move up. And, and our interpretation of that is that the market 18 months out is already looking through the recession that might appear, that might occur, or it looks past the recession and say, um, we can see that the rates will have to be cut somewhere in the next 12 to 18 months to start stimulating, you know, if a recession happens again to help the economy, but looking through that, maybe 18 months from where we are now, um, you, you will already, you know, be through that and, and onto the next interest rate cycle. So that's maybe just a kind of a bit of a technicality to point out. On the right hand side, if you look at small business conference, which is also a very good indicator of the health of the economy, that's also very low. And again, when it gets to these uh, levels, historically speaking, um, then you know, it does show that there's increased risk of a recession. Now, the, the next logical, you know, very important question for us to ask is if there is uh, elevated recession risk still in the US and in the world, um, even though markets have been relatively strong towards the end of cycle, what will the what will the patient's budget required uh, need to be? You know, how how long might one have to wait before um, a recession maybe happens and, and there's kind of a, a, a clean out of the system uh, if that is to happen. And uh, Bank of America Merrill Lynch does good research on this. Um, the number of months or the length of each of these stages of the business cycle, and obviously, uh, you know, different different cycles are never identical. So there's always a, a bit of a spread, and then they show what the average length is. Now, if you look at this late stage of the cycle that's shown in the in the red block, it is so that. The, the historic average period that you spend in this type of this part of the cycle is, is fairly short. Um, the average is three months, but unfortunately, uh, this is the part of the cycle where cycles do differ a lot from each other. So the, the, the spread of how long it can take uh, is particularly wide, up to 34 months. So that says in, in the past, uh, there's been... Uh, occurrences and cases where it almost took three years for this late uh, stage of the cycle uh, to play out. You know, once um, interest rates get really restrictive, monetary policy becomes tight, the yield curve goes inverted. That's kind of the, your starting point of the of the last phase. And then the question is, how long can it take to play out? And uh, as, as it shows, it can take up to almost three years. Now, if we overlay that on the current cycle and we take into account that the U.S. yield curve started to invert in May 2020, um, and we say, well, it, it could take, if history, if at least some uh, examples in history repeat themselves, then it can take 34 months, then it means that this late cycle experience um, maybe of markets keeping to grind high, higher, um, the rates going up, uh, inflation staying a bit higher, can keep on going until 2025. I mean, if you add the 34 months, it uh, it takes you to March 2025, um, which means that, you know, if a recession were to occur, it could be as late as that. And it just gives you the general framework of, of what the patients are that uh, might be needed to deal with this situation. We get a lot of uh, international research from macro research houses, the likes of Bank, uh, uh, sorry, BCA, the Bank Credit Analyst, and also uh, Alpine Macro and Ned Davis. They are all uh, top global research houses. And in the last uh, number of quarters, they've, you know, in their research documentation provided information as to when they expect a recession likely to happen. And as you can see summarized in the table, most of them kind of indicate end of this year, uh, early next year, first quarter uh, or second quarter of 2024. Um, but few of them, or 
none of them actually talk about 2025. So even the even the the top macro uh, researchers are kind of more expecting of a potential recession if it happens to happen next year. Um, they're not thinking it'll be as delayed as what the um, the previous research maybe indicates. So it just also shows one that there is a fair amount of um, uncertainty, unfortunately, that comes with um, comes with the environment. Um, you know, it looks like recession might happen next year uh, as a few of the me the metrics point out but it could actually uh, test our test our patients and and even or delayed longer uh, post 2024 maybe into 2025 so if we move on to a, a, a bit more of the of the economics um, and the explanation as to why these things are working out the way they're working out. Um, I think one question to ask is why, you know, given all the talk of high inflation and all the talk of a very aggressive Fed, and the Fed have raised interest rates by five and a half percent in the last less than 18 months, you know, given that, why has the US economy remained strong? Because it's still growing at between two and three percent it hasn't collapsed into recession yet um, and by extension why is the market you know stayed strong obviously because earnings have have remained strong enough have not come off materially yet and that's again a reflection of the of the strong economy that's remained strong now one reason uh, that one can point out is the is the shape or the condition of the u.s consumer uh, because U.S. is a is a heavily consumer-driven, internally, uh, internally kind of oriented economy, um, and the graph on the left-hand side is instructive. It shows the excess savings that U.S. consumers and households accrued during the COVID period. So the blue bars show the month-on-month -month change in the excess savings. Remember they receive those stimulus checks that uh, that in the COVID period were intended to, to protect households and protect the economy. Um, the black line show the cumulative buildup of those savings. And at the peak, um, there was about $2 trillion of excess savings uh, in the bank accounts of consumers. And the expectation was that that could support the economy uh, in a downturn and that it could support markets if it were to come into the market. Um, but also that's an explanation of why inflation is uh, remaining uh, stickier in certain components uh, than what one otherwise would have expected. There's this wall of money uh, that, that that is still there. Now, this explains why the US economy maybe remained stronger and is currently remaining strong stronger than expected but what one must also uh, observe and acknowledge is that since uh, kind of the latter part of 2021 and into 2022 they started a drawdown um, in this excess savings so higher inflation higher prices of goods um, you know had effect on consumers and they started spending down those excess savings and as you can see the cumulative savings are now down to about the 500 uh, million billion um, dollar level. And depending on which kind of metric one look at, whether you look at the level of savings or the savings rate uh, in terms of its direction and you extrapolate that, it, it seems to indicate that around about the middle of next year will be the point where these excess savings um, are, are extinguished. Or eliminated. Now, um, as one can logically foresee, that might be the point where there are additional strain coming to the economy when the, when the consumers have have basically spent down their excess savings uh, on consumption, um, and and then the real belt tightening happens. So, as again, as a economic um, slowing indicator. If not a recession indicator, that would be um, one 
one aspect to keep in mind that the, the buffer certainly on the household side will probably be spent uh, by the middle of, of next year. Another reason why um, the recession is postponed or, the, or the, the final stage of the cycle is drawn out uh, or dragging out is the behavior of the, the fiscus, or the fiscal side in the US economy. And, and very interesting um, for maybe for reason, for political reasons of, of um, you know, pending uh, elections next year, maybe because aging infrastructure need to be uh, replaced. Um, there are a number of reasons why the, the fiscal policy in the US have actually been expansionary. They've been spending on, on fiscal uh, spending also lower taxes or the lowering of taxes. There was the student debt uh, standstill or the relief of student debt where they, uh, 30, 30 million uh, people with student debt didn't have to repay uh, or make their repayments on that for a certain period of time. And in fact, now I think in September, October, that program is ending and they will have to resume their debt payments. But, but that have been positive fiscal expansion uh, in the recent past, and that have offset the effect of higher interest rates. That's the, the point of the slide. Although we've had a very steep interest rate hiking cycle, one of the steepest on record, sorry, it's the red one, um, although we had this, this very steep increase in, in, in interest rate and monetary policy, there's been this offsetting fiscal behavior lower taxes, student debt standstill, spent on uh, infrastructure, um, and, and that offsets some of the effect of higher interest rates. And in our assessment, um, that is part of kind of dragging out the cycle or delaying um, the, 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 the recession if there is recession risk. Just one other thing to point out on the top right-hand side, if we look at the um, what they call the ratio of um, vacancies to the unemployed, that is still quite high. And in order to get inflation under control, this ratio, which is currently at about five, the ratio of vacancies versus unemployed, meaning there's five jobs for every one unemployed person, uh, five vacancies at least, that number needs to needs to come down. Um, to get inflation under control to something in the order of two times. Um, and that speaks to the fact that the Fed will keep the pressure on from a rates point of view, um, and that unemployment will probably have to rise to, to kind of grow into the vacancies, uh, if one uh, kind of puts it that way. The dollar has been very strong. The bottom left-hand graph points that out, and a strong dollar is a drag on economic growth uh, for the world essentially um, so that that holds growth back or it slows growth down and also interest rates have now gone real interest rates have gone positive in the us so you know 550 basis points of interest rate hikes and inflation that is trending lower certain parts of inflation at least have now um, yielded or you know caused real interest rates to go positive for the first time in a number of years post-COVID and that is also restrictive to the economy so as soon as real rates go positive um, it, it becomes restrictive for economic activity so all these things although the the economic slowdown is delayed tells you that they are significant breaks um, on the U.S. economy and by extension, uh, the world economy. The reopening of China and the speed with which that happens um, is also something that might be a bit dragged out. The, the main graph on this slide show that at the end of last year, when their economic reopening news came out, there was a lot of optimism. Um, the graph shows the, the percentage of investors or asset managers surveyed that expect a stronger Chinese economy. So there was a lot of positive expectation at the end of last year and in the first quarter of this year. But because of the slowness 
with which uh, that this policy news actually came out from the Chinese government, there's been a bit of a cooling off in sentiment, um, unfortunately, and, and that is also what gave rise to the, the negative Chinese equity returns that I showed on one of the previous slides. But if you look at the left-hand graph, um, there is a high correlation between forward earnings in China and the survey of corporate profits. So if you if they look at the surveys of, of businesses, they expect increasing corporate profits, but the actual forward earnings um, has not followed that yet. So there's a delay. Similarly, if we get trailing earnings, fairly good correlation between that and the business confidence indices, which is just another kind of business survey metric. Um, and again, there's, there's a bit of a delay. So the business confidence is, is improving as the economic news expectation improved, but the, um, the earnings has not come through yet. Um, that is still to follow. So we are optimistic about the general economic prognosis for China, but we do acknowledge that because the slowness um, of the policy response after the, re the reopening hype, um, that it might be delayed. And, and we, we are looking for uh, increased policy responses from China. And, and most recently, it looks as if there's an improvement in that. Um, they've just had a, a Politburo meeting um, and the noises coming out of that is kind of more positive around uh, supporting the economy, but we, we will need to see a, a, an increase in that um, for China to really be a, um, a driver of growth for the world. There is an interesting argument, just as an aside, uh, an interesting argument that says that slower growth in China now is actually what the rest of the world needs because China currently exports deflation to the rest of the world and it helps to bring down inflation in the rest of the world. If Chinese growth were to be extremely strong uh, in the immediate future, uh, they might actually start uh, exporting uh, inflation um, and that'll keep inflation in the rest of the world potentially much higher for longer and um, might then cause problems for the rest of the world. So these things might take time to play out. I think that's the, the general message that we're trying to convey. And the question is, you know, should we, should we panic about not being in the market? Um, should we chase, uh, you know, the, 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 the markets going up that we currently observe? Um, or, or how does one think about this? Now, this slide, I think, is, is very helpful, um, certainly interesting. And if we look at the start in the top left-hand side, that graph shows the behavior of markets, and it looks at the, the MSCI or country, and it looks at the behavior of the market after in the 12 months after the first rate hike. So when you are at peak of cycle, sorry, when you're at bottom of cycle and you start raising your interest rates, how does the market uh, behave in that uh, in those periods? And if you look at all the, the previous cycles, then you see on average, the market is slightly up by about 6%, MCI world, all country world, but there's significant downside. That's what the, the gray line shows. So although on average, the market is typically up at the start of the interest rate hiking cycle, there is this risk of drawdowns. If you look at the second graph, it looks at the 12 month period post the first rate cut. Now that's the, the, the period that we will soon be approaching. If the, if the US Fed is now close to the rate, uh, the peak of the rate cycle at five and a half percent, and the economy slows, and maybe there's a recession or a mild recession, then they will eventually start cutting rates. So, you know, we are moving towards that point of the first cut in the next cycle. Now, what does the market do after that? Interesting enough, 12 months after that, the market on average was flat historically, but with a high, with a high uh, spread, you know, some, in some cycles, it was strongly up. In some, strike, some cycles, it was strongly down. But on average, it was, it was kind of flattish. And then the last graph is it moves even further into the cycle. And it says, what is market behavior in the 12 months after the last rate cut? So the, so, excuse me, when you get to the, 
the end of your cutting cycle. Um, what does the market then do? And, and very interesting, the market is strongly up on average, but even more interestingly, the downside is quite limited. Um, there are instances where the market is down by only by about 10%, but the average return for the market through all those cycles was, was in the 20s. So the point of this slide really is that if this historic interplay between market behavior and the interest rate cycle holds, then it tells you that it's actually the end of the rate cutting cycle. When you get to the, the, the last of the cycle, that gives you the, the best risk adjusted equity returns. Um, not necessarily the first um, period when the rates are cut, as we will now imminently experience. And, and it's really just a, another way to say one does not need to be uh, overly hasty with these things, or uh, time is actually on your side. You can you can um, use patience because it's actually later in the cutting cycle where the strongest and the better quality equity returns um, come from. And, and it's quite logical why it works that way um, in my mind, because again, interest rates work with a lag. So when you get to the, to the last cut, you, you've already had all the benefit of the previous cuts. And that's why the equity market is then at its strongest. Whereas when you look at the first cut, it's the first signal of good news, but but the full effect of interest rates still need to, to, to work through the system. And that's why you don't get um, such dramatic uh, behavior from markets in the first 12 months after the first cut. Back to the point of, of patience, um, you know, what, um, what else comes into play? Um, another point to to make reference to is that usually as per Alpine macro, looking at the past, it takes about 24 months between the start of the rate hiking cycle and the peak of inflation. Now, we started the rate hikes in March 2022. Uh, if you take a, a typical 25 month period into account, then it means the peak of inflation um, should actually be somewhere in the first quarter of 2024. Now, inflation has already been coming off. So how does one kind of reconcile that? Um, and the graph on the right-hand side gives a bit of a clue about that. The, the inflation that has been falling has been the supply side uh, constraints that have been loosening. So it's the bottlenecks post-COVID uh, and the input side and the supply side that's been improving um, of late. And that's what's brought inflation down that we've seen so far that's the um the, the red dotted line but the blue line which uh, loosely speaking refers to demand inflation or or consumer side inflation that has not materially uh, come down yet and and that correlates to the statement that typical inflation is consumer or demand side inflation um, that's the typical nature of inflation not kind of COVID, you know, disruptive disruption to the supply side, that that as a cause of inflation is not that typical. Typical inflation is 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 demand driven. Um, and and this historic measurement of a 24 month period um, from the start of your rate hikes until inflation peaks seems to be borne out by by the blue line. So again, this just tells you that um, we will have to have patience for these things to fully play out because they do work with lags. Uh, monetary policy and um, the impacts that it has on things like inflation and the economy works with significant lags, anything between 12 and 24 months. Just further to that point, we've already mentioned it, but we've had a very steep rate hiking cycle compared to history. Um, shown on the left hand side and it's also shown on the right hand side the blue arrow here show that the 12 month moving average of the fed funds rate is now around about the three percent level although we know the instantaneous rate is now at five and a half um, and what this tells you is because of the steepness with which this happened but the fact that it takes time for it to work through the economy it tells you that a lot of the already implemented interest rate hikes 
still have to have their effect on the economy. And that effect is going to play out over the next two, three uh, or four quarters. Valuations actually look okay. We've mentioned that before. Um, certainly in South Africa and in uh, developed markets, X the US. So if we look at long-term valuation scores um, that take long-term earnings uh, movement into account and, and kind of the, 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 the mean reversion in that, something like a CAPE ratio uh, or a Graham and Dot PE ratio where you smooth the earnings uh, that you use in the calculation and it's supposed to give you quite an accurate uh, sense of where a market or asset loss is, is valued. If you use that metric, then the developed market is the most expensive. Um, certainly the US drives that. Um, Japan and Europe a bit better, but still a bit on the expensive side. And then the rest, China, emerging markets, South Africa, actually looks fair to better value. So valuations, certain locally, um, is 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 reasonable is not the problem but again one must acknowledge that the correlation between valuations and what your short-term subsequent returns are are very low and that's what the graph on the left hand side shows it shows you that in the short term one year or two years cheap valuations don't necessarily give you good returns there's a low correlation between returns and valuation as that period stretches, though, and gets longer, the correlation gets higher and higher and higher, meaning if you have a five to ten year holding period and you start with cheap valuations, there's a very high probability that you're going to get good returns. So that's good news for the medium to the longer term. But unfortunately, um, this low correlation does not help you in the short term. It, it, it says even though an asset class might be cheap or offer value, it does not mean it's going to translate into returns in the in the next year or two. And again, makes the point that patience um, is required. Also, when you respond to uh, good valuations, you might have to wait for the payoff to happen. Similarly, um, if there is a bubble developing in AI stocks and tech stocks, uh, because of the AI kind of mania that we're currently experiencing, that can also take longer to play out um, than you know than than what one might might guess. Um, the previous Nasdaq bubble lasted three years, and you can see it here on the left-hand graph. The PE ratio of the Nasdaq in the late 90s um, it went all the way to to 80 before it came down. Um, to 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 much less lofty levels. Now, if you overlay the March 2022 to the current period of the Nasdaq, it is um, it is it is still in its infancy. If it is a bubble, you know, and, and that just tells you if bubble forming were to happen because of AI mania, then this can uh, keep on going for quite a long period of time. We think it's quite. Uh, risky to to chase such a narrowly driven market that is literally kind of made up of a few 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 shares. Um, but as I mentioned, the 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 better way in our view to try and capture this is to invest in managers that follow thematic approaches. There are a number of funds and or managers that that uh, follow a philosophy of thematic investing, and they will cotton onto themes like this, like AI, uh, and additionally also the typical growth managers who, you know, who invest in the long duration, high growth stocks. Um, and those are also typically, you know, uh, represented by these AI shares. So they will also migrate into that space. But we, you know, rather than investing too narrowly in a in an AI index or tech index, we will rather uh, do it in a bit more diversified way through uh, thematic or, or broadly growth-oriented managers who have a bit of movement space within their mandates. Having said all of this about uh, the economy and the cycle and equity markets, um, if we turn to bonds, then 
we want to make the point that uh, it is quite possible that a bond rally is closer than than what um, you know, than maybe is expected. And the next number of slides deal with that. Now, bonds is the the most defensive asset class in periods of recession. It typically protects you well, especially U.S. bonds. Um, we are in the favorable position that U.S. bonds are now paying you a 4% yield on the 10-year, whereas four years ago it paid you very little, below 1%. So the yield has certainly improved. And if you look at the real yields, which is shown here, uh, they are now extremely elevated. So uh, it looks as if as inflation comes down uh, and as the the, the recession or the, the inflation risk eventually abates that these these yields can come down and you potentially can see um, quite good returns from bonds. Bonds also uh, kind of lead the, the cycle. And what I mean by that is as you go into um, recession and beyond, bonds perform first and, and then after that equities. So bonds look forward, equities too. But bonds are the most sensitive to the to the economic uh, cycle. So on the point of timing the bond markets, what this table shows is um, previous um, kind of cycles, interest rate cycles. So if you look at the heading on top, it says it shows the number of months between the last hike in the cycle. And remember, we said we're close to the last interest rate hike um, from the U.S. Fed in their cycle. They're currently at five and a half, and uh, there is uh, at least some views that that might be the peak, that July was the last um, hike in their cycle. They might keep it higher for longer, meaning they'll wait until they start cutting, but but it, 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 it might be that that was the last hike, so that's where in the cycle. And what the table then shows is in, in previous cycles, what was the period in months from that last interest rate hike to certain events? And the first event is the peak in the 10-year yield. And you can see the bond yield actually peaks on average a month or so before the interest rate peak. Now, if the interest rate peak therefore was 5.5%, it might well be that US bond yields have already peaked or are at the point of peaking. Um, and after that, they'll start trending lower and you'll get capital gains. That's the important point as the yields come off. And, and again, you know, it's, if you think through how the dominoes fall, it's a case of the last rate hike tells you you're at the point of, of maximum tightness in your monetary policy setting. Thereafter, there's still a, a lag. So it works with the lag. So there's a period of time that um, that that uh, runs before the economy kind of really slows down because of those interest rate hikes, and and typically when that slowdown happens is when bonds then start to um, the yields start coming off, um, and and bonds prices go up because now you you get that kind of protection that that bonds give you, that the yields fall in anticipation of a lower or slower economic environment. Or recession, and and as the yields drop, the bond prices go up, and that's why bond prices um, give you good protection against the recession. So we might be close to that point. In fact, you know we might have seen the peak in the ten-year yield. Um, similarly, so the the low point of the excess returns of bonds versus cash also happens about a month before the last hike. So from that point onwards, bonds start uh, outperforming cash. And also the, the the inversion of the yield curve starts to uninvert um, around about one to, to two months um, after the last rate hike. So, you know, these are, are fairly kind of immediate, short, small numbers in terms of the number of months that it takes. Um, so the general point is once you get to the peak of the rate cycle, then there typically is movement in the bond market fairly soon thereafter. That is favorable if you are an investor in bonds. This slide, um, just elaborate further on that theme. Um, 
on the left hand side the line shows that when you get economic weakness nominal gdp growth is the black line when you get that economic weakness you typically do get uh, bond yields falling rolling over the 10-year rate that falls and, and that provides you with capital protection and what the table in detail show is that um, if you look at previous starts of the recession or, or you look at previous recessions put it that way um, through that recession you typically get a decline in bond yields which averaged about 2.6 percent so that tells you when you get economic weakness bond yields fall and on average they fall by 2.6 percent during a recessionary process and if you look at this table that shows you what a drop of two and a half or 2.6 percent in yields um, actually imply then you can see here that from a current us 10-year yield level of about four percent if yields were to fall by two and a half or 2.6 percent it'll take you into this 15 to 20 percent return area for us uh, bonds so it's a long way to say that bonds protect you in the recessionary conditions um, bond yields in the us fall typically by two and a half percent at least during recessionary periods and because of that you get capital gains of anything between 15 and 20 percent and that's what makes it kind of the the king of defensive asset losses um, when there is really uh, economic stress if we compare this to south africa this graph shows the the starting orbi yield and then the return that you get in the next two years given where you start again if you start at a very high yield and that's where we currently are then typically that yield fall normalizes and as it normalizes from the high level you get quite strong returns and and it is quite interesting as we point out in the last bullet point here that from the current levels of the orbi of 11 12 percent uh, you, you you typically get the same kind of capital returns uh, that we saw in the previous graph for the us so this is really a favorable uh, yield territory for bonds it's not to say it can't go higher it can't it's not to say it can't make you wait until the returns materializes but uh, just as in equities a low pe is a good starting point so in bonds a high yield uh, is a good starting point if you have um, a reasonable expectation that it is overdone and that the yield will mean the revert or, or normalize a bit to uh, to more modest levels as it normalizes you get healthy capital gains from bonds but can it be delayed uh, unfortunately yes and what we show on these lines are if the inflation numbers of the last few months are extrapolated for the next 12 months then again this looks at the us it will mean that us headline inflation will be at around three percent in the first quarter of next year and core inflation will be around about four percent but that is still too high the target is, is around about two percent so again if the short-term inflation don't keep on improving if that were to kind of remain sticky and and kind of you know on a month-on-month -month basis now uh, stop falling then um, in the first quarter next year core inflation is still going to be above the band and the fed will still if not hike rates further at least keep rates uh, at the same level so it means that you might have to wait we've we we said just a bit earlier that we are at the peak of the fed hiking cycle but you know it, it might be that you have to wait for a prolonged period of time before you see the first cuts and move into the cutting cycle if inflation um, remains sticky so this is the kind of the, the implication of the shorter movements of inflation that we monitor to try and give us an idea um, where it's gonna you know where it's gonna settle and and with what speed it's gonna get to the band because that tells us what the behavior of the Fed will be. 
bond sentiment, unfortunately, is also negative. So even though there's good yields on offer, um, investors are still kind of short U.S. bonds. Um, and if they remain short, you know, they won't be buying pressure that forced prices upwards or yields downwards. So uh, one is also um, dependent on the sentiment towards bonds changing and acknowledging the good returns that, that they offer. So a bit of a, a summary slide, and then maybe I'll speed up a bit after this. I think the rest of this just show the, the, the application in our uh, portfolios, but, but maybe as a bit of a, a summary about of everything that I've said. Um, while an underweight DM call, and specifically the US call, seems most prudent from a risk management perspective, given the fact that they are late cycle, given the fact that the valuations are quite high, um, there is a risk that it can remain in this late cycle for longer than, than expected, especially if there's an AI bubble forming and, and the market is, is just driven up further, but, but quite narrowly. So we need to take that into account. And, and practically, it means you, you can't be completely out of the US. So it'll just be too, too risky to do because the show there can go on. Typically, healthy exposure or overweights to better valued opportunities and opportunities that are better positioned in their economic cycle make sense. So that speaks to overweights or healthy exposures to Chinese equities, Japanese equities, emerging, emerging market equities generally. Um, but again, those investments are, are, are quite dependent on policy um, and specifically policy in China. You know, policy in China will determine the, the prognosis for emerging markets, including South Africa. Um, and there was recent articles that you might have seen that, that made the point that South Africa is a China story. It is not a, it is not a, a, a US story per se. Uh, because we're a, co a commodity country, we are heavily influenced by, by the Chinese economy uh, and by Chinese policy. Another point is that, you know, all the risk signals certainly around the recession the risk point to the fact that it's, it, 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 it is a good idea to have defensive positions in bonds, DM bonds and SA bonds. They offer you very good yields, goes for nominals and for inflation linkers to a degree. Um, but again, even that can be delayed for the reasons we've given. You know, the, re the recession can be delayed itself, the sentiment around bonds can therefore be delayed um, and and one will have to be patient. It is the right asset class to, to have defensive exposure to if there are going to be weaker economic news, but, but again, uh, it, it might take time to deliver the returns that one see on offer. So what then do we do in the second half of this year? Um, we do feel that we, we need to Kind of trust the process in how we analyze these things and we need to do you know, we need to be patient um, relief rallies us test one um, as we've experienced this this year to date uh, from the us and, and in the last quarter as well but bear markets also take time recessions take time to to to, to happen because of monetary policy and, and bear markets take time to develop. And that's what the graphs on this slide shows. The, the very left side one shows the 1981, 82 bear market and overlaid on it the current period. The middle graph show the, the 1999 to 2001 bear market. And typically they, <laughs> they take two to three years to fully play out. Um, and as you can see by the broken line or the incomplete line, um, where we currently are uh, in our market experiences um, gives one the indication that that we might not have seen the low point in equities yet um, if if the current bear market or if there is going to be an extension of a bear market it can still go on um, for a while and secondly you do get these relief rallies so you get episodes where the market in a broader bear market actually give you quite strong returns. Now, um, 
That means you can't be too underweight because then you miss out on those. But it also says that you need to um, show resolve with your overall cautious positioning because, you know, they are relief rallies, but they, they can make new lows. Giving a, a brief summary of our own analysis, looking at the, the, the numbers and uh, on this score basis of minus three to three that I refer to, the first thing we look at is the economics background. So economic growth, inflation, monetary policy, fiscal policy, and geopolitical risk, all the high level top down economic metrics that influence economies and ultimately the markets. and to point out, inflation is still a problem. The numbers are still negative. It's on the wrong side of the score sheet. Um, growth is relatively low. It's not recessionary yet, but it's certainly not very strong. And then geopolitical risk is is still quite elevated, and that you know that relates to Chinese policy. It relates to the relationship between the U.S. and China. It relates to the Russia-Ukraine war and the potential that that still has to put uh, disruption on food supplies and inflation, for example. You might have read that Russia have cancelled the grain the grain deal that there was that allowed exports of grain out of Ukraine. So, you know, the pressure points there uh, come and go, but it's certainly not all over yet. So geopolitical risk is, a, is another risk. Um, you know, indicator, and if we aggregate all of that and we look at the current quarter, then um, the you know is is still you know a bit of deterioration going on. So previous quarter, the average score was just below zero, and now it's deteriorated a bit further. So it, it tells you the, the economic fundamentals as monetary policy does its work and as the other risks. Uh, like geopolitical risk prevail and as inflation uh, stay sticky in certain areas, you know, the, the pressure on the economy just keep on building. And one needs to acknowledge that. Return to the regime, which is uh, another way of looking at it and just saying, you know, these, these recessionary signals specifically, um, how do they look? Financial conditions is on the tight side as monetary policy tightens, real interest rates, have now gone positive, meaning it's a negative. That's why the score is negative. Positive real rate slows down the economy. The bond curve is inverted, which is a, a red flag for recession risk. That's why it gets a full minus three. Credit looks okay. That's neutral. The equity market, certainly in the developed world, is still expensive. Um, and the dollar is very strong, which is a break on the world economy, as I mentioned earlier, and therefore that also gets a negative score. So it, apart from credit, which, which has not blown out yet, unfortunately, all the other big metrics that can be recession indicators are, are showing negative um, scores. Um, and that is the reality. So, you know, also just to make the point that we don't just kind of, you know, you know, suck it out of our thumb or, or, or get under the impression of what we read uh, around the recession and form our opinion on that. We, we firstly want to be led by the hard numbers, and these are the, the hard measured numbers that show that um, there is elevated recession risk, unfortunately. Similarly, if we look at the, the more granular economic uh, measurements, Things like business confidence, consumer confidence, capex, PMIs, purchase and manager index. So all these things that give you indications of the health of the economy. If you aggregate all of them, they also are still negative for most of the of the world. So it means there is economic pressures building up. The U.S. dollar is very strong, uh, almost uh, about twenty percent too strong against other developed markets on average. Um, and between 20 and 30 percent too strong against other emerging markets. So the dollar is super strong, um, and that puts a lot of pressure on uh, the economies in the rest of the world. There is a lot of support still for the US dollar. What we do here is we look at the variables that influence currencies, and 
we look at the U.S. relative to other geographies. So if you look at the, the first column that, sh that shows Europe, the green coloring shows you that for the U.S., all these different metrics is still more supportive of a strong dollar compared to Europe or compared to the euro. Um, so, you know, looking at economic fundamentals in the U.S., although it's slowing, Europe is in worse shape than the U.S., and therefore uh, the, the dollar still finds support. Um, these numbers will have to turn red before we can expect a weakening dollar that might be a, a bit of a pressure valve, escape valve for uh, growth in the rest of the world. Turning to asset classes, and, and again, we continue with this minus three to three scoring. We look at all the main asset classes, SA equities, SA fixed income, develop and emerging equities, China and global bonds and property. Um, the valuations, as I mentioned, looks okay for SA and China and EMs. For US and DM, the valuations don't uh, look so appealing. That's on the expensive side. But across the board, the weak economic environment and the weak regime environment of high recession risk is what ultimately de deteriorates the numbers. So we, uh, we form a, a risk-adjusted view on each of the asset losses based on the economic side and the valuations and the currency risk. And unfortunately, it is the macroeconomics that poses the bigger risk. Um, and then you end up with these uh, numbers in blue that shows marginal positives to neutral for the SA asset classes, but underweight for uh, developed world asset losses, all else equal, um, and still a bit cautious on China, but China and EM looking better than US and DM um, within the, the global universe. We can extend this to a more granular set of asset losses. So then we look at small caps, we look at the sectors, we look at LBs, overseas small caps and, uh, and other geographies outside of the US, but the picture remains broadly the same. So the US and the DMs are the most expensive um, in terms of our valuations. SA valuations look okay, but it's really the, the macroeconomics that dampens the risk appetite uh, that one might have. And if you look at styles, um, we get uh, a similar picture. So in South Africa, quality and value is the better value, but they're not very cheap. Three would have been very cheap. They're kind of close to zero, but they're on the right side of zero. So SA value and quality styles, that's the likes of Fuert and Alan Gray. Um, quality is Blue Alpha and Clyde Terso at Investing Opportunity. Those are the, the better valued styles. Globally speaking, um, growth and quality is quite expensive. And you know, this is where the AI shares sit. They typically get bought by the quality and the growth style oriented managers. So as they have become more expensive, um, as the market ran up, the style have, have, have become more expensive. Value looks better. Global value and global momentum looks better. Um, so we, we do want to make sure that we have exposure to these better value shares Valued style, sorry, but we also understand that you know global quality and growth, even though it is expensive, can keep on going if a AI fuel tech bubble um, is is going to prevail that drive the the growth uh, and the quality and the long duration shares higher. If we purely look at the geographic scores, uh, country country scores. Look at the economics, look at the asset valuations, look at the currency. The picture is very much the same as what we saw on the asset class side. US and DM is the least preferred. Um, SA looks better. China looks better. EM looks better than the DMs. Japan looks better than the other DMs. So it's really a picking order from an expensive US and DM at the top uh, down, the, down the scale. Uh, the other ex-US DMs looks better, and the EMs in China and SA looks best. Um, 
So those are the you know those are the the starting points, but we need to overlay it with the fact that the US might keep on going a bit longer. Just a point about the views of the main research houses, BCA and Alpine Macro, also now consistently, ex, you know, have a, a negative view on equities for the third quarter and the fourth quarter of this year, um, and a positive view on bonds and a neutral view on cash. So it's, it's very much similar to our own view of being a bit underweight and careful of equity uh, if we are pre-recession and rather um, investing in, in bonds uh, as a defensive position. So capital preservation remains our main focus. Um, and how do we translate that into portfolio guidance? From the top level, the, as I've now said a number of times, the, the top-down macro environment steers you in the direction of being underweight um, and quite materially underweight because the signals there, like the, the inverted yield curve, is very negative. So that's maybe where maximum neg negativity comes from. Regional allocation, we go for a neutral setting um, with slight overweights to EM and China. Um, and the reason why you know we're not more underweight the US and the DM is this kind of late cycle strength that I referred to and the fact that it can keep on going longer than what you expect. Um, and therefore you need to be cautious not to be too far out of it. Uh, but you know that's the high level country. If we drill it down to to the asset class or the investable opportunity set, then the way we apply it is to be uh, overweight bonds as a defensive asset class, overweight Chinese equities on their better economic and valuation fundamentals, although we acknowledge it might take time until the, the policy becomes strong enough to, to unlock this. We do have some gold, which is a protection against recession and market downturn. Um, EM, which obviously is highly influenced by China, is a slight overweight. We are neutral, uh, much of the rest, I suppose, but typically uh, ex-US. So we have positions in Japan, Europe, um, DM ex-US essentially. Uh, and then the underweights are real estate. We are still a bit circumspect about SA real estate. The valuations are very cheap but the macro environment is not very conducive for SA real estate and then small underweights in SA equity. But SA equity can easily be a neutral. The only reason why we have slight underweights is because we have the EM and the China overweight. And because SA is also EM, um, you, you need to add all of that together and then you, you almost get to a, a neutral stance. But if um, portfolios are overweight EM in China, then it does make sense to compensate for that by having slight underweight uh, SA exposures, but then very definitely underweight US and DM equity exposures. On the style side, we take no uh, specific tilts, although, or except a small tilt to global growth and quality to tap into those prevailing um, themes around AI and US tech in case they have much longer legs than expected. So bringing this to portfolios, um, there's two choices and we discuss that with our clients. Um, the first choice is to um, not only strongly focus on valuations, but to be more sensitive about the macro regime risk in the short term. And effectively it means being more cautious of, of recessionary risk. Then it, uh, it speaks to this position, which is uh, a bit more underweight in equities and a bit more overweight in defensive assets. So anything underweight, SA equities of 10 to 5% compensated by overweight in bonds, overweight in Chinese equities because of their better fundamentals uh, and overweight global uh, bonds and underweight uh, developed equities. And, and, and overweight gold. If one takes a view that you want to look through the recession risk, so you are more valuation conscious 
and less uh, macro regime conscious, then you don't have to have these material underweights because then you say to yourself, you look through the recession and you acknowledge these evaluations are actually quite cheap. So then, you know, you, you stay much more neutral uh, or slightly underweight SA equities um, and you pull in the, the overweights that you otherwise would have had in gold and in bonds uh, and in global bonds. So, um, so if one take a longer term view and you only focus on valuations, then you kind of pull the, the bets closer to the middle, um, less, kind of less underweight equity, less overweight bonds. But if you um, want to kind of react or protect more against a potential recession coming, then you, then you stretch it out a bit and you go a bit more underweight on the risk asset side and a bit more overweight on the on the defensive asset side. And this is the um, the view, this kind of macro regime risk conscious view is what we implement in the in the best blend portfolio range um, that we manage um, and use as a building block for some of our portfolios. Um, but you know there are some of our clients who are much, much longer term focused in a way and, and say to us, you know, they don't want to react to to the short term economic uh, and the regime signals in 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 strong ways they rather want to focus on valuations and and this is the positioning setting for them which we will discuss um, at the at the quarterly meetings these were for the local portfolios and then by extension the global portfolios um, look very similar underweight dm and us um, overweight uh, china and em overweight developed market bonds um, and there's two variations of it, the, the kind of more spread out one, if you want to um, react to the short term top down macro risks and, uh, and a more kind of valuation focused setting if you want to just focus on long term valuations. In the portfolios that invest in multi asset loss funds or balance funds, uh, predominantly, we have a number of quarters ago, encouraged clients to take a what we call a defensive block of fixed income or flexible fixed income managers that can invest in uh, the entire bond yield curve, um, the likes of Visio Unconstrained, Portfolio Metrics, um, and a few others are aggressive examples of those. And we said that given the high yields on offer in South Africa um, and the good opportunities in our bonds that can be harvested, um, given the recession the risk that we want to acknowledge, it does make sense to put the extra defensive block in the in the multi asset loss portfolios. Even if you invest in balance funds, um, trim across the board a bit of the money from the balance funds and put it in this high yielding defensive block, and that remains the setting um, as long as those recession risk signals are negative. Once they start normalizing or playing out. Um, and worst case scenario that will happen after a recession has happened then we will put this defensive block back with the balance managers but at least we've built in uh, an additional bit of defensiveness um, in a way you know as a way to be a bit more uh, responsive and active with portfolios not just passively leaving it to get the average of the balance funds we do think the recession risk is high therefore we think one can um, be a bit even additionally more defensive and luckily we we have this um, very high bond yield in south africa that make that possible currently and offer the opportunity to to earn a good fixed income return while you are being defensive on equities for the time being and that is really the end of the presentation um, i apologize that i went on longer than um that i promised um, but uh, it is a lot to get through to as you get to get through as you heard uh, but i hope it gave you a very good sense of um, why we hold the views that we hold and why we advocate the positions that we advocate um, in in very short summary um, the us is expensive but ai and tech can potentially keep on running so you need to acknowledge that the rest of the world x the us looks better um, especially emerging markets, China and EM, but a strong dollar is a break on that system and on the payoff that we get from that. We will 
need to see probably a, a, a peak in US rates um, and we would like to see a weaker dollar and a more stimulatory Chinese uh, policy regime to, to really um, kind of put, give a bit of a tail a tailwind to to emerging markets, including South Africa. So that um, that on the one hand, and then on the pure recession the risk on the other hand, the fact that interest rate policy works with a long lag means that a lot of the high rates will still have their impact on the economy. Um, combine that with the inverted yield curve from the US means that one um, must be careful. Uh, it is it is unfortunately not to say that we're out of the woods yet. So uh, we do think in portfolios, one must uh, be a bit more defensive still. Um, it might take, unfortunately, another 12 to 24 months for this to play to play out fully, uh, but uh, patience will be needed because these things do take time um, to, to, to play out. And uh, if you think back to that uh, typical profile of a bear market, um, you will remember that it takes two to three years and that's just kind of the reality of how it works. Um, there's no way of, of forcing these things uh, to happen quicker um, than what they do. And one needs to respond to what is uh, on the table and, and what the external environment poses at you and position your portfolios um, as robustly um, and as intelligently as you can to protect against the risk that you see and to position for some of the, uh, the opportunities that you see. Um, and we, we hope we get that right. And, and that's what we will be discussing in more details with you at your meetings. Thank you very much for, for joining us. I hope it was valuable and um, enjoy the rest of your day.